Hello and welcome to the 16th episode of our Fundamental Principles Communist Production and Distribution by the Group of International Communists Reading Group Series. Today is Tuesday the 10th of May 2022 and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. Today we finish Chapter 15, The Introduction of Communism in Agriculture and start Chapter 16, The Economic Dictatorship of the Proletariat. This week I have the new patron Gareth Morley who just signed up for an annual subscription to Tank. If you like those extra Patreon-only episodes and creating Discord over on the Discord server, head on over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Also, if you'd like to help support the book project that Donald and myself are writing, you can head over to the website the Classless Society in Motion.com for more details. Everybody who donates will get a signed copy of the book, their name in the acknowledgements, and get to take part in a reading group series, just like the one you're listening to right now. Okay, enough commie grifting, let's join the discussion. Okay, welcome to the 16th session of our Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Reading Group series. Today we are finishing off chapter 15 and hopefully doing the last two chapters, 16 and 17, and finishing the book proper this week, if all goes well. So that's the plan. Let's see if we can get through all of this. Part C, we're going to talk about the agricultural proletariat and the small and middle peasants in the German Revolution. Randy had his hand up. Randy, do you want to start reading? Sure. C. The Agricultural Proletariat and the Small and Middle Peasants in the German Revolution. Let us now take a closer look at the attitude of the peasants in the German Revolution. For this purpose, however, it is necessary to describe briefly the general situation in November 1918. When the imperial violence collapsed in Germany in November 1918, it was certainly not through the proletarian revolutionary activity of the masses. The war front collapsed, the soldiers deserted by the thousands. In this situation, the German navy wanted to try one last big effort by a persistent blow against the English. The sailors thought, rightly or wrongly, that they would all die in the process, and this became the instruction for mass denial of service on the warships. Once on this course, the sailors had to continue, because otherwise the mutinous ships would have been shot to the ground by the faithful troops. They, therefore, raised the red flag, which led to the revolt of the other warships. Herewith, the redemptive act was done. The sailors would have to go on now if they did not want to be shot by the land army. With iron necessity, one deed developed from the other. So they marched to Hamburg to call for the help from the workers. How would they be received here? Would they be beaten back? There was no talk of any resistance. Hundreds of thousands of workers declared their solidarity with the sailors and the revolutionary activity was expressed in the workers and soldiers' councils. Thus began the triumphal procession of the revolution throughout Germany. And this was the strange thing. Although the military censorship had all reports of the Russian Revolution of 1917 under its control, although no propaganda was made for the idea of councils, and although the Russian structure of councils was completely unknown to the German workers, a whole network of councils had spread over Germany in the space of a few days. The civil war that now followed was under the sign of socialism. On the one hand, social democracy, which saw socialism as a simple continuation of the concentration process of capitalism, with the legal nationalization of big industry, and which had to destroy the councils as the embodiment of the self-activity of the masses. On the other hand, the newborn communism, which considered nationalization only attainable by illegal means. The goal was the same, but the path was not. Although the occupation of the factories by the proletariat was generally carried out through the entire revolutionary period, nowhere did it come to occupation in the name of society. The factories always remained the property of the old owners, even here and there under the very primitive control of the workers. The fact that it did not go further is due to the lack of self-confidence of the German working class. The workers listened to the German counter-revolution, which under the leadership of the social democracy wanted to prevent the workers from arbitrary expropriation. On the other hand, the revolutionary part of the working class that wanted to move from to direct expropriation was still far too weak. The proletariat itself seemed to be divided on the question of communism, and consequently, the revolution was very weak. The revolutionary working class had to join all of its forces to defend itself against counter-revolution and could not yet think of expropriating its owners. It goes without saying that this is why the large middle class in society, who are forced to defect to the victor in the revolution, 
were driven to counter a revolution by themselves. Okay, so it's interesting. We're talking here about the history of the German Revolution. And he says this line here, which is, I think, pretty uncontroversial. When the imperial violence collapsed in Germany in November 18, it was certainly not through the proletarian revolutionary act activity of the masses. It was, well, what can we say about that? It was initially by the revolutionary action of the, of the troops and subsequent support of the masses. I suppose these revolutions all can't start everywhere at once. But it's getting towards the point that it wasn't so much the, the trigger wasn't so much a, an endogenous worker you know, revolution, but a revolution that was brought on through the crisis of capitalist war. So that's something to note. Like, it's one thing that McNair is always talking about, like, you know, the importance of, of war in, for revolution. Like, do we have any proletarian, do we have many examples of proletarian revolutions? outside of of war or at the very least a collapsing collapsing empire like could people say do people consider like the was it the the portuguese revolution of 73 do some people say it was kind of like a proletarian revolution or was that something more through the military defeats yeah so my understanding of the portuguese revolution is that it was actually initiated through officer defection and in part brought on by the failures of what was going on in the uh, colonial states that they owned. Yeah, like is, is, is 1968 in France, is that like kind of nearly the closest to a, a proletarian revolution outside of war? Well, that's even that's like more of uh, seen as more of a student initiated, right. right? Yeah. So it is, I think you make a good point that a lot of it does tend to come back to war, but yeah. 68 is a bit of an unusual one. Uh, Chris wants to speak. Yeah, I know there was a massive general strike in Quebec in the early 1970s. That, As far as I know, I, I can't think of any war it could have been triggered by. It's interesting because I think it's probably the biggest general strike in North American history, but there's very little written about it, and it's sort of forgotten. Uh, I think partly because everything... Related to it is, you know, it's all francophone and very, very much associated with the uh, French Canadian working class, which always had sort of a national identity. But yeah, I, I, I that's just one example that's kind of popped into my head. But it, like a general strike is a general strike, but it, it, it mightn't be necessarily revolutionary. You know? it, ex exactly. But I mean, in terms of just a, a massive general strike in all sectors of society, taking part, but maybe hobbled by um, nationalist ambitions, you'd say? Like we had general strikes in Northern Ireland in the 70s to yeah. destroy the, uh, you know, the unions got together to destroy the kind of peace process in the 70s, the Sunningdale Agreement. It's not even like a left-wing phenomenon. No, no, not even necessarily, no. I don't think there's anything truly revolutionary without him. In some kind of military escalation that I'm aware of. But we, like, I think we probably should be kind of dialectical about it as well, as in, like, you know, the actual wars themselves are also a function of the class situation. You know, it's like discussion amongst the leaders of the various parties before World War I were like, they were afraid of the socialist, communists, you know, the anarchists, say, like the German, they were afraid of the German working class. You know, they were they thought, well, let's let's throw the the young kind of radicals into the war machine and chew them up. So, like, even the war itself is a function of the social relations. So, yeah, it's, it's a it's a gamble, really, by the bourgeoisie. On the one hand, disciplining labor, but you know that can also backfire if they're self organizing. You know, you think of the Russian Revolution, or or even just uh, upticks in organizing after the Second World War, and. Right. I, I kind of see it if they mismanage the war, if they start losing the war as the Germans did or the Russians just very inept at it. I think that's when things could start <laughs> really pointing towards civil war. Right. Uh, Emil has his hand up. Yeah, just a short note. Uh, you just mentioned that they were afraid of the working class. And the question, of course, of, is why were they afraid? And the reason, I think, 
is that they were organized. Germany had the largest Marxist movement on the planet at the time. And that's, I think, one of the weaker points of this uh, of this book is that they neglect the whole party question to be irrelevant or something like that. <laughs> I'm not, not entirely sure about what, what they want to say about it because they, they are saying, well, the German working class rose up. They, they took the council form of organization, but they weren't aware enough. They weren't conscious enough. And oh, well, the question then becomes, how do we get to that point? And I think the party question is quite a, kind of central into that, into, uh, that uh, point. Very good, yeah. Somebody, Slavic in the, in the, in the chat says, What's, what initiated the Spanish Revolution? Do you have anybody here who knows that? Was it? Uh, I'm, I'm a bit hazy on that myself. The Spanish mm-hmm. Revolution, uh, the, the 1930 Civil War, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Right. That, that was a constitutional uh, crisis. Was it yeah. like a Republican dominated elections and then there yes. was like a reactionary putsch against the Republicans? Yeah. Which, Cause it all to fall apart. Exactly. Yeah. That right. basically was uh, Franco uh, trying to uh, take over classic military putsch uh, things uh, and restoring order for the capitalist. And well, that that's sparked the civil war. Yeah. There's another little bit here as well. I was I found interesting. Although the military censorship had all had all reports of the Russian Revolution of 1917 under its control, although no propaganda was made for the idea of councils, and although the Russian structure of councils was completely unknown to the German workers. A whole network of council had spread over Germany in the space of a few days. Like, how correct is that, like, historically? Like, it, it kind of sounds a bit unbelievable to me that the Germans didn't know, the German working class had no knowledge of, like, the Soviets in, the, in Russia. Emil? Yeah, I think that that's, that's quite wrong because the, the earliest forms of Soviets were already formed in uh, 1905, in uh, that revolution. Uh, so they had to know. But like, I, I don't quite buy this. <laughs> but we're talking about 1918 here in Germany, aren't we? Right. So th- by yes. 1918 is a year. They would have known with the Russian Revolution by then. It's a year and a half since the Russian Revolution, you know, the February Revolution. This is November 1918. So I, I find that a little bit unbelievable. Well, I, I think it's a question of maybe some... Because Rosa Luxemburg wrote about the 1905 councils, correct? She wrote about um, the 1905. She wrote about 1905. the 1905. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I question how much of the, like, regular worker, maybe, may, not the intellectual, but the regular worker knew of the councils. I think, to some extent, it shows that the council form is kind of this spontaneous form that shows up. Right, Yeah. Yeah, it also says that the factories, the factories, which, you know, let me read this section here. Although the occupation of the factories by the proletariat was generally carried out throughout the entire revolutionary period, nowhere did it come to occupation in the name of society. The factories always remained the property of the old owners, even here and there under the very primitive control of the workers. So like, and the fact that it did not go further is due to the lack of confidence self-confidence of the German working class. That's kind of, it is kind of crazy, really, in the middle of the revolution. But we, we saw more of them taking control of the factories in, in, in Russia than we did in Germany. Is that correct? I think we saw more of it in, in Russia, if I remember from the previous chapters, what they were saying. The proletariat itself seemed to be divided on questions of communism, and consequently, the revolution was very weak. That that seems to me to be very, very true. Slavic. Yeah, I think the part about social democracy wanting to prevent expropriation in that segment right there is quite damning. I think it's probably one of it's it's definitely the toughest point for me to figure out what to do because that to me that says his stance on the party, because if the party isn't what initiated the revolution, right? And on top of that, the party is actually advocating something that is anti-communist and therefore counter-revolutionary. It does really put into question, like, what is the role of the party if it's just going to be counter-revolutionary in these circumstances, if it can't even initiate the revolution? And that, that to me, is quite damning and concerning. Why, why do you mean, why do you think it's like, 
specifically, what do you mean when you say it's concerning? Like, as in, like, the party form inevitably goes that way? Or, you know... Well, you... it. I don't want to say it inevitably does. That's part of the... But historically, it, it seems to have moved in that direction. And that's, like, the very concerning part. Because, obviously you know, socialists play a role prior to revolutionary uh, revolutionary situations organizing, right? But where they have the most influence is in the time of crisis. And if at the time of crisis, they're doing the exact opposite of what needs to be done, then one could potentially argue that that's a counter-revolutionary organization. And that's concerning because what has led to that, right? Yeah, like I kind of, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not surprised that it goes that way. I think that you know the revolutionary movement is bound to have gone that way at least the first couple of times. I just feel like that's the inevitable pressures of capitalism, like that the the working class can't, you know, the workers, like that's how you learn through history. In kind of my opinion, like the through the failures of pushing forward and pushing forward and seeing the failures of the different stuff. So I, I think the I, it, it kind of feels like it was a necessary, it was, I don't know if it's a necessary step, but uh, it seems very probable to me that that would be what social democracy would deform to. Kielce. I guess the, the interesting question then is, is whether this happened in Germany because Germany was a more advanced country and, and didn't happen in Russia because it wasn't, and, and, and therefore whether it was inevitable that, parties of the, of, the, of the proletariat wouldn't succeed in, in more advanced countries but that's far wider question than I think we're, than we're interested in exploring too far Yeah, that's a biggie that's a biggie um, it's the un unknowable question isn't it uh, an interesting an interesting final uh, line here uh, let me just read these two lines here the revolutionary working class had to join all of its forces to defend itself against counter-revolution and could not yet think of expropriating its owners. It goes without saying that this is why the large middle classes in society who are forced to defect the victor in the revolution were driven into counter-revolution by themselves. So they're kind of making the point that in Russia, you see the working class was perhaps maybe less split and that the middle classes went towards the new regime when they saw it was being dominant as opposed to here. Is that the general point? I think you can also you could also, I think, fair to say that perhaps the political machinations of the various German parties weren't as expertly led as by someone like Lenin, who people can have their own opinions on whether he was good or not politically, what was his opinions, and we can critique him all that. But it's undeniable to look at uh, Lenin and, and not see him as an ex as an extremely smart strategic thinker i wonder how much of the problems of the german stuff is a lack of political leadership over just material conditions as well that's kind of something that screams out at me yeah i i find this the middle class go to counter revolution the, the middle class going to pick the winning side seems like an inevitability although i i don't know how much a middle class would ever sign up to a labor time accounting system because they can't be the they can't be the the the, the ruling bureaucracy in that system to the same extent as yeah they they totally wouldn't <laughs> yeah like it's so it's it's like it, it it seems to be that you you can imagine you will not be able to get large sections of these middle classes over to this where you could get them over to a social democratic a uh, radical social democratic kind of thinking. I think it's possible. Slavic. I mean, I, I think it's I think it's possible to build these alliances, but the movement has to demonstrate enough confidence of its own. I think that's essentially what he's arguing here. So if the workers had expropriated, right, it would seem like they have an actual chance of winning, and that could potentially tip you know, tip more people to their to their side. What's interesting is that the middle classes, I don't know if that's 
I mean, the peasants certainly ended up siding with the proletariat in Russia, despite them being in a more having their own, I guess, not completely immersed in commodity production, right? Because they still had like their own domestic economies. So despite that, they still ended up siding, but that was in part because of the land question, I think. Let's just go straight into this next section here. Randy, do you want to read this next section? Sure. This applies first and foremost to the peasants. If communism was so weak in the German proletariat, how much weaker should it be among the peasants? In fact, we see that the peasants were not an essential factor in the revolution. There was no independent organization with its own position, with the exception of Bavaria, when the dictatorship of proletariat was declared there. Here the peasants had to speak out, and the same phenomenon was evident as with the proletariat. They did not appear as a closed unit. One part of the peasants chose the side of the revolution, another part opposed it. As far as we know, there is no data on the character of the peasant farms which took the side of the revolution. There is also a lack of more precise numerical ratios. Except in Bavaria, the farmers hardly took part in the revolution. There was no talk of direct support, and the general mood was clearly antipathetic. The slogan, the land to all the farmers, made no sense in Germany, because small and medium operational units are strongly represented. Although there is still a great deal of large land ownership in Germany, the peasants have shown no willingness to divide these goods. While the primitive slogan, the land to the farmers, could unleash such enormous psychological forces in backward agricultural areas, the slogan proved to be without influence in Germany with its large agricultural enterprises based on scientific agriculture. The explanation for this must lie in the nature of the Western conglomerate, which functions directly as an industry. The large grain estates are worked with modern machines, and the grain is stored in large barns. In the cattle breeding areas, there are extensive pastures with stabling facilities for hundreds of cows, while the milk is prepared in the company's own dairies. The large potato fields in the north are entirely specialized in this crop, and the liquor factory is grafted directly onto them. The situation is similar in the province of Saxony, where everything is specialized in sugar beet cultivation for the affiliated sugar factories in Magdeburg, etc. In these conditions, the slogan, the land to the farmers, and the sense of the land division according to the Russian model cannot find a breeding ground. The agricultural workers would not know what to do with the land. In the cattle area, they could, however, get a piece of land and a few cows, but because their dwellings are not furnished as a farm, they would not be able to run their business as cattle breeders or dairy farmers after all. On top of that, they lack the tools to exploit their property. These conditions apply to the whole of the German large-scale land ownership, and we can, therefore, say that the highly developed state of agriculture prevents land from being divided up. The workers who create there are faced with the same problem as the industrial workers, with the takeover as a whole in the name of society. But the agrarian proletariat did not even come to the problem in the German Revolution. The agrarian relations of production determine that the thousands of proletarians do not find their conditions of solidarity within a small area, which makes it difficult to establish a united front of struggle. The German agricultural proletariat did not or hardly ever form consuls and played no role in the German Revolution. Peculiar was the attitude of the so-called semi-proletariat in the countryside. In particular, in Germany, there is a lot of industry in the countryside, a phenomena which is also becoming more and more prevalent in the Netherlands. This may co coincide with cheaper labor, as well with lower land prices and other burdens. Because the workers needed are recruited from the peasant population of the surrounding area, and because they work a fairly large piece of land in their free time, they occupy an intermediate position, which we call semi-proletariat. The character of the agriculture is that of a closed domestic economy. What comes from them to the market is not important. The peculiar thing now is that the semi-proletariat was a force that stopped at nothing in the revolution. Several times they went forward in the movement. They went on strike and marched to the surrounding towns to broaden the basis of the struggle. Thuringia is a telling example of this. But these workers also did an excellent job of supplying the cities with food. At the beginning of the revolution, when the council still held power, the peasants held on to the food in order to raise prices. The councils in the city then contacted the councils in the factories in the countryside, and the semi-proletarians, who were completely familiar with the situation there, forced the peasants to deliver their product at fixed prices in Hamburg. In summary, we can say that, in general, neither the German agricultural proletariat nor the German peasant participated in the revolution. Even though the agricultural proletariat may have had communist reflections, they were still extraordinarily weak, which meant that they could not yet express them. It seems that the peasants adopt a wait-and-see attitude in a proletarian revolution. 
This will generally be determined by the force of the revolution and by whether the large agricultural operational units intervene in communist production. Okay, the general point being that the German state of agriculture was very different than the Russian state of agriculture, that people were self-sufficient, largely peasants in Russia, and that they were not doing much commodity production versus farming in the German state being largely for commodity production. And this meant that, like, when you say to somebody here, you know, land and land, peace and bread or whatever it was, like the, 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 the claim to land is not as strong. It doesn't grasp the German rural workers in the same way as if they were self-sufficient as opposed to production for commodities. You know, simple things like the size of the farms, not having like, you know, houses situated at the point of where your farm would be. You know, all of these things lead to the power of that statement not having the same strength. Interesting here, it mentions Magdeburg. <laughs> that was a blast. When I was reading this, that was a blast from the past. I cycled across Europe one summer back in the late 90s, like to 98, I think. And I cycled through Magdeburg, which is in East Germany, as far as, I, you know, it's definitely in East Germany. We were cycling in reasonably late in the evening, and uh, we'd been cycling like all day. We'd cycled, uh, there was, uh, we'd cycled about 120 miles that day. We met this English guy cycling as well. We met him in a petrol station and he cycled with us. We were going through Magdeburg and we, we hit the outskirts and it was just like, we cycled through, I don't know, it felt at the time like about five miles of like just industrial wasteland. As in like all these factories that were Eastern, Germ Eastern Bloc factories and every single machine building was rotting, rusting. It was quite shocking. Like I couldn't believe it. Like, it was definitely a, a good few miles of it. It was it was really something else. Yeah, that was just a blast in the past reading that. Okay, yeah, this bit here. Okay. The agrarian relations of production determine that thousands of proletarians do not find their conditions of solidarity within a small area, which makes it difficult to establish a united front of struggle. You know, I think that's kind of something that we've kind of hit upon in some of our stuff we did in the 18th Brumaire series about the kind of atomization of the worker in the workplace under modern capitalism. Is it leading to, like, is the productivity of capital, not just the productivity, but also the, the mechanisms and the working organizations they use, like outsourcing and stuff like this, but is the, the mechanism and the productivity of capital, uh, organizational methods, Leading to an alien, you know, like an atomization similar to the, you know, an, ag an agrarian relation. That's something that probably is probably happening. There's a tendency happening in uh, modern capitalism that's similar in places. What do people think of that or implications for it? Any comments? Alan. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how it is in Europe, but like here in, in the US, I think that's definitely true um especially with the level of like suburban sprawl that we have out here yeah it's a uh, I, I don't i don't know how to you know what what kind of answer we could have for that it definitely seems like you know it's, it's everyone for himself in, in a way like there is this idea as well that the urbanization the suburbanization of like of life under capitalism is is linked to the you know the depreciation of building stock in the central areas of cities and it's cheaper instead of keeping maintaining those buildings and building new stock further out but we it seems like we're seeing you know in most countries we're seeing the reurbanization you know certainly to do with the uh, how much of it is just speculative but we're, we're seeing people moving back to the center again so you might actually see like the a cycle in in in, in capitalist property relations feed into a revolutionary dynamic as well. Randy. Yeah, and it's interesting how he sees that the part of the agrarian population that was most revolutionary was the semi-proletariat. Those that were self-sufficient farmers, essentially, part-time self-sufficient farmers, and uh, who also worked in the towns, in the factories. So these people who really are essentially a, a bridging class so that's not very surprising that that would be the case. 
Okay. Any other any comments then on 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 this stuff, Slavic? Just a little background on Bavaria for people who don't know much about that part of Germany. At the time, it was not a well developed industrial sector, so most of the land was worked by farmers who owned the land, and there wasn't a whole lot of success with um, socialists there, in part because the SPD, you know, was trying to keep the party pre- very proletarian pure. But after after the war, it became quite a radical socialist area. Did it not become reactionary agricultural as well? Were there not Bavarian farmers that were sent down in to crush the Bavarian revolution too? I don't know too much about that. I just know it was partially led by Kurt Eisner, who seems to have tried to form like a people state of Bavaria. I don't know too much about that. I haven't read that much further. But apparently they had some socialist movement there. It was initially pretty reformist what was there. But I think once the war kind of set it on fire, it became much more radical rather than reformist. I just have a book here beside my bed here, beside my bed, beside my on my table here, beside me here. And it's got a picture of the staunch traditionalists of the Bavarian Freikorps who are seen marching into Munich with flowers in their hats were mainly responsible for driving out the communists of the Rater Public in bitter fighting. So I think they, they must have had both elements, you know? Yeah, that sounds of... pretty not nice, the Freikorps right there. Yeah, and you have them all wearing like tweed and flowers and stuff. Look like a like a going Morris dancing or something. Okay, I think we're good to hit the next one. Who wants to put up their hand to do a bit of reading? Where this is chapter 16, The Economic Dictatorship of the proletariat. Chris. Economic dictatorship of the proletariat. Finally, we must say a few words about the dictatorship of the proletariat. The dictatorship is self-evident to us and does not really need special treatment because the introduction of communist business life is nothing other than the dictatorship of the proletariat. The introduction of communist economic life means nothing other than the abolition, the abolition of wage labor, the implementation of the equal right of all producers to the social stocks. It means the abolition of all privileges of certain classes. Communist business life does not give anyone the right to enrich himself at the expense of labor. Those who do not work will not eat. The introduction of these principles is by no means democratic. The working class carries them out in the most intense and bloody struggle. There is no question of democracy in the sense of cooperation between the classes as we know it at present in the parliamentary and trade union system. But if we look at this dictatorship of the proletariat from the perspective of the transformation of social relations, from the perspective of the mutual relations of the people, then this dictatorship is the real conquest of democracy. Communism means nothing other than that humanity is advancing to a higher cultural level since all social functions are placed under the direct direction and control of all workers, thus taking their fate into their own hands. This means that democracy has become the life principle of society. Therefore, a substantial democracy rooted in the administration of social life by the working masses corresponds exactly to the dictatorship of the proletariat. Okay, that's pretty heavy section. So let's let's break it down there. So the introduction of communist business life, that's an interesting way they put it, (laughs) is nothing other than the dictatorship of the proletariat. So they're making this case that like this, this basic function of the communist revolution is to change the wage relation and this is what the this changing of the wage relation is what the dictatorship of the proletariat is all about it's about wiping away the previous social relations and it's saying this is the we are we are doing this we are taking communal ownership of stuff and we are abolishing the wage relation randy so is this 
equating the business life to the economic life, like communist business life to communist economic life? Or is that more like re relations at the workplace versus like the economic system as a whole? Who knows? That could be a translation issue. You know, like that could literally just be a translation error or it could also be, you know, a joke, perhaps. I don't know is the answer to that. But they're kind of getting... They're trying to very much link this idea, the concept of the of the proles with this fundamental changing of the economic laws. The introduction of, of communist economic life means nothing other than abolition of wage labor, or the implementation of equal rights, of equal right of all producers to the socialist stocks. Well, it probably means a little bit more than that. Like it probably does mean about like confiscation of bourgeois property rights i suppose if you want to be technical you could say you know i i don't think that the bourgeois ownership rights as well so it's i think they're being somewhat pejorative in saying that it means the abolition of all privileges of certain classes the introduction of these principles is by no means democratic inverted commas democratic the working class carries them out in the most intense and bloody struggle there is no question of democracy in the sense of cooperation between classes as we know it at present in the parliamentary and trade union system. Making the case like that there is no route to parliamentary revolutionary uh, dictatorship of the proletariat. Not, this is not to say you can't build a parliamentary revolutionary party, but the, the, the fact is, is that it's like it will be a battle you know, between the classes not in passing votes in parliament it will it will go to the streets it will it will end up being a, a clash of power between these these classes and not a not a debate in the house of commons randy sure so i think in this kind of section overall he's mainly just saying that you know like we just said the way that we get to this communist business or communist economy is not going to be democratic but then the actual interactions of the workplace are you know hyper democratic right that's kind of what he says in the next paragraph that we read yeah that's right yeah yeah so like this it uh communism means nothing other than humanity is advancing to a higher cultural level since all social functions are placed under the direct direction and control of all workers thus taking their fate into their own hands this means that democracy has become the life principle of society Therefore, a substantial democracy rooted in the administration of social life by the working masses corresponds exactly to the dictatorship of the proletariat. Alan. Yeah, I just I, I, I can't help myself. I feel a need to pedantically nitpick the terminology a little bit. I feel like dictatorship of the proletariat, you know, that's a class dictatorship is is something, you know, that that's talking about the form of like state in the Marxist sense of the institutions of class rule. And so basically dictatorship of the proletariat to me is the period of revolution, right? And that establishes communist economic life if we're lucky. But the equation they're they're making here of dictatorship of the proletariat is the, you know, introduction of the of the communist economic life. I don't know if that's really right. It, it's to me it's the it's the struggle and the revolution is the dictatorship of the proletariat. And then, you know, the economic life is set up after that in, in a way, I'm maybe not directly one after the other, you have to develop it, I guess, but I, I feel just let that slide, I guess. I, like, I feel the kind of maybe why they're being so much into the economic part is that it's like the economic part is a, like, so the revolution needs two components, you know, it needs that like, battle on the street but it also needs that implementation of the new economic legal relations uh, it needs both of them to be a communist revolution and i think they're trying to point towards how important it is that it's not just a thing you get a dictatorship and you start ordering people around that it's more fundamental than that you need the you know you need these economic laws underwriting it all which i think like is the critique of essentially all communist revolutions yeah that they've they've never they've never actually done the, the 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 most important bit that we're talking about here and they have essentially been a 
a kind of a, a kind of a counter revolutionary force. I, I do get your point. It's like, but it's I think it's both, you know. But I think they're putting definitely more weight on this. I think for rhetorical, I think rhetorical and argument reasons. Okay, let, let's head on to the next bit. Chris, are you still going to go? Once again, it was up to Russia to turn the, this dictatorship into a caricature in that the dictatorship of the Bolshevik party was declared the dictatorship of the proletariat class. This closed the door to real proletarian democracy, the administration and management of social life by the masses themselves. The dictatorship of a party is the form in which the dictatorship of the proletariat is actually prevented. In addition to the social significance of the dictatorship, we also consider its economic content. In the economic sphere, the dictatorship works by making the new social rules to which operational life is subject generally applicable. The workers can bring all social activities themselves into communist operational life by accepting its principles, by carrying out production for the community under the responsibility of the community. All together carry out communist production. It is obvious that various parts of the agricule will not directly comply with the rules of communist operational life, i.e. will not join the communist community. It is also probable that some workers will interpret communism in such a way that they will want to run the operational units independently, but not under the control of society. Instead of the private capitalist of the past, the business organization acts as a capitalist. Here, the economic dictatorship has the special function of organizing the economy according to the general rules to which the social accounting in the uh, general gyro office fulfills an important function. In social accounting, we find the recording of the flow of goods within the communist economy. This means nothing else than that those who are not members of the social accounting cannot receive raw materials. Because under communism, nothing is bought or sold, Producers can only receive goods and raw materials from the community for further distribution or processing. However, those who do not want to include their work in the socially regulated work process exclude themselves from the communist community. In this way, the economic dictatorship leads to the self-organization of all producers regardless of whether they are small or large scale operational units, whether they are industrial or agricultural. In fact, this dictatorship is immediately lifted as soon as the producers include their work in the social process and work according to the principles of abolishing wage labor and social control. It is therefore a dictatorship which dies of its own accord as soon as the whole of social life is placed on the new foundation of the abolition of wage labor. It is also a dictatorship which is not carried out by bayonet, but by the economic laws of movement of communism. It is not the state that carries out this economic dictatorship, but something more powerful than the state, the laws of economic movement. Right. Some interesting little bits there. What I was saying previously, where they talked about, you know, what happened in Russia when the Bolshevik party was declared the dictatorship of the proletarian class. The dictatorship of a party is the form in which the dictatorship of the proletariat is actually prevented. And I think, you know, if you look to Russia, they did destroy the power of the Soviets in Germany. They destroyed the power of the councils. You know, the SPD did. I think we, we see that kind of behavior kind of repeatedly. People who call themselves Marxists and communists and all that, when the people actually try and do stuff, I think they often want to shut it down. Perhaps, you know, sometimes it's that the workers themselves 
do not have the idea of what they're of of what it's supposed to do no more than the actual communist or marxist parties did to get to communism and you know you could imagine that there's all manner types of sh- all manner of, of things going on that will lead the, the the parties to want to restrict it but that is merely a you, for me it's like a I think you've got two bits going on there. Probably the, the, the working class is not developed enough. Uh, they don't have the right ideas or the right theory at that time. And also the parties probably don't want ever to really, are, are the type, are frequently parties don't want to relinquish power and want to assume it for themselves. So you have kind of a, a combination effect going on there. I kind of like the way they talk about the dictatorship here. Let's uh, have a look where they talk about how some units, agricultural units or productive units, won't want to join. Say you have like syndicalist elements or, you know, some kind of libertarian communist elements, and um, but you have a large organized mass of proletariat, organized communism along the lines that we're proposing in this book, that the fact that you are excluded from production if you don't follow these same legal rules you know, is a way, it's essentially a way of forcing people into these, into this productive, in, into, to follow these wage labor, uh, destroying the wage labor rules. Because like, if you, like, if your movement is big enough and say you control 70% of the economy, and maybe there's 30% bourgeois hangouts or other forms of, say, anarchist production or left com production, that you would actually find that because of the complexity of modern production, that they won't be able to get all their inputs to reproduce themselves and that they are forced into the same system and that this is also a large element of the dictatorship of the proletariat. And it's not like a state going there with a gun, but it's the self kind of, they say here, what do they say? The self-organization of all producers in this way, the economic dictatorship leads to the self-organization of all producers, regardless of whether they are small or large-scale operation units, whether they're industrial or agricultural. In fact, this dictatorship is immediately lifted as soon as the producers include their work in the social process and work according to the principles of abolishing wage labor and social control. It is therefore a dictatorship which dies of its own accord as soon as the whole social life is placed on the new foundations of the abolition of wage labour. It is also a dictatorship which is not carried out by bayonet, but by the economic laws and movement of communism. It's not the state that carries out this economic dictatorship, but something far more powerful than the state, the laws of economic movement. Okay, Annie, uh, Randy. So one thing I kind of want to go back to a little bit is whenever it made a distinction, whether it was wrong or not between the communist business life and communist economic life it seems kind of and after reading this whole chapter it seems kind of like the communist business life is the like the proletariat stage and then once everything is kind of accepted once the dictatorship dies then you have the economic life or do you do does that make sense or do we think it's just mistranslation or whatever i don't know i i, I kind of feel like it might be uh nearly like a sarcastic joke yeah to say communist business life or but it could also be just a translation of a term so i wouldn't like to put too much emphasis we kind of we've gone down a wrong i kind of went off on the wrong thing before randy talking about uh labor force instead of labor power and it turned out that was purely trans translational yeah so yeah, I would I would go with the, the instinct that it's probably just translational and we, we can try and clear it up with Herman and see what he says, you know, before trying to put too much interpretation on it. Somebody threw their hand up there a second ago. Whoever it was, they can uh, speak. I, I don't see any problem with, like, I think it might be sarcastic, but, you know, also, seriously, you no, know, we're, we're talking about business life. And uh, I can't think, I know in French, it's uh, laissez-faire, you know, just just the doings of society, right? Not necessarily the work, but the overall functioning of society, the business of everyone. I, I see that as maybe a term that could be appropriated, but uh, I, it is just a semantic thing. In terms of the democratic stuff, that was 
interesting because it it veered often into kind of Ordiga talk about we we have nothing we don't care at all about democracy that has nothing to do with what we're doing, but then qualifies it at the end by saying oh but actually democracy is uh, you know this just uh, you know the self organization of the working class and which is kind of kind of like the something that early Marx would have said I think but uh, yeah I don't know those are just some random reflections. Yeah, it's interesting because he, he when he says this is not democ- democratic, he says it in inverted commas. Um, right. So, and then it clarifies that it's not bourgeois democracy. I, I think the difference is oh. Bordigo wouldn't have used the co- inverted commas. He would just have said, no, it's not at all. <laughs> well. uh, Kielce. It just occurred to me that we're kind of being offered a choice here between the dictatorship of the proletariat or the dictatorship of capital, because I don't feel like capitalism is democratic, possibly even property as well. So it's more like the economic model where we, um, rather than the sort of like the decision-making model. So it's, we're used to just talking about dictatorship as if it's around like the political, how political decision-making is made, but we have very little control over how uh, the democratic control over how, over over how you know other people's money is spent, or how other people's property is is managed, and uh, so I, I find this unpacks that 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 quite well, and it, 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 or at least it sort of leads in that direction in terms of like, well, we're just trying to force you to use this economic model, but then we're being forced to use a different economic model, so that's only natural. Yeah, it's interesting as well, isn't it? Like because like even the capitalists have don't really have that much control over what they can spend their their money on you know like there's a dictatorship of value relations determining production decisions you know so it, it it plays into all of that stuff yeah i think that's a good insight there's a comment in the chat there by donal do you want to say something on that uh yeah i can i mean i think it's been mentioned before in the book so it's nothing new but when they're really talking about the dictatorship like a big part of it is just purely the economic relationship. So let's say you have a firm and they decide they're going to go outside of this system completely and just as if they were in a capitalist economy, just start trading things on the basis of exchange value. Well, the idea here of the dictatorship would be that's fine, but you get cut off from the gyro office. You get cut off from the the public ledger, the F plus C plus L in and out of your firm. So you can't access society's stock of capital goods. And it means you're finished, you know, unless you can bring them from the outside or something, illegally import them or something like that. So I think that's that's a lot of what they mean. Yeah. If you'd like to help fund the book that Donald and myself are writing about communist economic planning, please head over to the website the classless society in motion.com where you can donate to our fund to help us get this book out in a finite time. Everybody who donates will get a signed copy of the book when it's released. So head on over there today and help us with this really important project. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. Thank you.